So I have the pleasure of closing out the first day of talks for Beam Digital Summit 2020, and I'm hoping to keep you deeply engaged and riveted as we talk about the very most boring pieces of running a production pipeline. Um, so first, I'll give you a little bit more uh, overview of who I am, my relationship to Beam, so you have some sense of the biases that I'm bringing to the table here. Uh, first, I need to to figure out how to change slides. All right, so who am I? Um, I am a data engineer at Mozilla. Um, we have a couple of projects, uh, our products. We just released um, a VPN. Go look at Mozilla VPN. Uh, but uh, you know us for uh, the Firefox uh, browser. So um, most of what I work on is the, the pipeline for getting data from, from Firefox. It's deployed on cloud data flow. Uh, we process about 20 terabytes of data per day, um, over 2 billion records. And I'm an occasional poster on the Beam mailing lists. Um, I try to answer questions when they're relevant to um, your technologies that I've dealt with directly. I've had the pleasure of interacting with um, maintainers on a couple of PRs uh, for the Beam Java SDK, mostly documentation stuff, um, BigQuery IO uh, support. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, an error handling API that we were able to uh, contribute to Beam. I do some technical writing. Um, I'm Klukas on the ASF Slack. Uh, feel free to email me at jeff.klukas.net as well. Um, and I'll be hanging around on Slack if we don't have enough time for, for questions um, today. So uh, what's the objective of this talk? We want to explore some general principles about using Beam for data transport use cases, um, but make it concrete by referring to a specific context. So uh, Mozilla, we get to do a lot of our work in the open. And in our case, all of the code that I'm going to talk about is in the uh, this GCP ingestion repository. Um, and feel free to check that out. I'm going to be referring to it uh, a lot. My hope is that by the end of this talk, you will feel uh, comfortable going there and looking at more of the details um, and you know, kind of use that as a, a public resource for the, the Beam community um, about you know, how, to, how all these pieces can, can fit together in a real use case. So uh, agenda today is I'm going to give you a brief system overview of you know, how, how our pipelines fit into our overall architecture. Um, and then the, the main content of the talk will be that section two. I'll talk about how we uh, model data as it's flowing through our pipelines, how we handle errors, how we configure our code and try to modularize different input and output sources and syncs, and then you know, how we approach testing. Then we'll kind of review all that again and talk about a few additional concerns that we didn't get a chance to talk about in those main sections, and then I'll take some questions. So a system overview, I'm going to build up a diagram piece by piece. It starts with data producers. And in our case, the, the big producer is uh, Firefox installations on, on desktop computers. Um, so I, I have to pause at this point and say that Mozilla is very interested in what we call lean data practices. So we have a, a whole section of the organization that is uh, dedicated to data review and data stewardship. So basically, we do not collect something unless there's a specific question we are going to answer with that piece of data. We have strict controls over you know, what, uh, what kinds of data we are willing to uh, collect and what kinds of data we consider um, toxic. So most of this data that we're collecting from Firefox clients is performance information to you know, help understand your know, regressions, how various features are, are working in the wild. Um, so data producers send uh, JSON payloads to this ingestion edge service, um, which is actually a, a bit of Python. Um, so we haven't gotten any uh, Beam yet. Uh, that edge writes to a Google Cloud PubSub topic, uh, which we call our raw topic. So this is kind of the, the entry point to where we can start doing interesting things uh, with the data. So Google Cloud PubSub is it's a message queue technology on the GCP platform. So one place, uh, one consumer of that data is a Beam pipeline we call uh, the raw sync. So this is basically responsible for doing nothing other than reading those messages from the raw topic and getting them to BigQuery reliably. So it's using BigQuery IO for writing out. It's using PubSub IO for reading things in. There's another branch where we go to a decoder, which is another 
uh, Beam job running in Dataflow. Um, that does more interesting things of doing some cleaning of information, et cetera. We aren't going to go into that uh, in this talk, what's going on there. We're just focusing on getting data in and getting data out. So the decoder ends up writing its transformed output to another pub subtopic. And then we have two more syncs that write out that data in, in two different formats to uh, different BigQuery tables. Then the last piece here is that we also have an error topic. So the decoder can produce errors. Some messages won't, uh, won't process properly. And we want to be able to reprocess those later. So we put those on a separate topic. And then we use another instance of this same uh, sync job to get that data in, into BigQuery. So I want to underscore that you know, these five boxes here that are green and have the little beam B, those are all data flow jobs. And they're all running the same code base. And really, they just differ in the you know, command line options that we send when we deploy these. So uh, you know the one of the big promises of Beam is also that you know what I've shown you so far was a streaming pipeline, uh, but we also use Beam in batch mode for all of our backflow scenarios. So each of these big query destinations represents a, a group of tables, and we have various workflows where if we need to reprocess things, we can read from one of those kind of more more raw uh, destinations and um, reprocess the data into one of the more cooked destinations. So let's talk about how we model data as it flows through here. So we're getting into uh, specific, um, specific topics now. For pipelines like these that are primarily interested in moving data rather than transforming it, the payload content usually isn't very important. You just want to make sure that it arrives intact uh, you know, the same way that it gets to a destination intact the same way that it arrived. So you can usually just treat it, uh, treat it as an opaque array of bytes. But you usually need a little bit of metadata to go along with that for routing, uh, et cetera. So for example, uh, something we don't show in this diagram is that we actually have a concept of different document types with different schemas. And having some metadata attached to messages helps us route uh, those messages to the right tables. So it, it turns out that PubSub message, um, the class that's in, so this is in uh, what you're looking at, the code example right there is from the Apache Beam repository. This is in the Java SDK um, underneath you know, the GCP submodule. And we have this PubSub message that's used in PubSub IO. So when you call PubSub IO.read, this is the thing that you get out. And a PubSub message is uh, an array of bytes. Uh, that's your main message, and then also has this uh, this map of attached attributes that can help describe what is this message that you're sending around. And this actually ends up being exactly the way that we we wanted to think about data for our pipeline. Again, we're primarily concerned with moving the data from one place to another rather than inspecting its contents. And so having this array of bytes along with some metadata that we can use for um, determining where it goes is, is perfect for us. So we've actually adopted this. You'll see if you read through the code base, pub sub message is, is everywhere. Um, it is the standard kind of format that we're passing between transforms in our Beam code. It's also nice that this already has a defined coder, um, which when we were implementing this, um, that was a, a major concern. It, it's kind of a pain to have to write your own coder, and uh, you can make mistakes there. If you define a message with some more structure rather than this kind of loosey-goosey uh, map of attributes, um, you can totally define your own class. Um, if you're doing that today, I definitely recommend, recommend you use auto value for generating classes. And auto value schema is in Beam, uh, which will generate a schema and therefore a coder for you as well. So um, definitely pros of this approach of having you know, a a, a pretty loose format is that it's been easy to, to iterate on this. Um, we do have the problem of you know, different transforms might expect different metadata to exist or not. Um, so by not describing that in kind of a more strongly typed uh, message, we, we can end up with situations where we don't have the right metadata at the right place. We rely on testing 
um, your realistic configurations of code to make sure that we have the right bits and pieces uh, in the right places. And we'll we'll talk more about testing later. Um, also, you can imagine with a, a container like this, if a message fails to process for some reason and you want to send it to an error uh, error output, you can just add some more attributes to the message to describe what's the error that happened. You know, if an exception was raised, what's that exception? What's the stack trace? You can you know include those things in this in this map of attributes without having to modify the payload itself. So that's getting into talking about handling errors. Um, I have a note on here, uh, see Valerie Lancy's error handling elements in Apache Beam Pipelines. Um, that's a blog post that talks about a lot of the same concepts I'm, I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Um, it really inspired uh, our initial work in you know, how we were going to handle errors in our, in our pipelines and how we were going to write things. So in Beam, there's really nothing magical about error handling, you know, at the at the end of the day, you have you know, the same you know, basic uh, bits and pieces. You have do functions, and those can have multiple outputs. So if you have you know a transform where you might need to you know handle a, a collection of errors, you know you define a do function that has you know your successful output and also has an additional collection for for your errors. So those pieces all exist. You can totally write a pipeline where you stitch those pieces together. Um, but we tend to think about errors differently. And we like to kind of have more elegant interfaces for being able to write the logic for successful output without having to interrupt that with talking about errors all the time. So in this diagram, we really only show one error case. So you can see you know, the decoder has that dashed line that goes to the error topic. That's kind of representing this is secondary output um, from the decoder. But in reality, actually, each of those BigQuery boxes, um, when we have a raw sync, error sync, decoded sync, there is the possibility that we'll have messages that we can't load into BigQuery because they're too large. And BigQuery has a limit on how, how large a row can be. So actually, in each of those syncs, we also have an error output where we write to GCS if we have a message um, that's too large. So let's talk more about that case of, of in these syncs, when we have a message that's too large, you know, what does it look like in our code to handle those errors? So what you're looking at in this slide is the main body of our sync.java class. So this is where we define our pipeline. And it is really not a lot of code because we've hidden a lot of the complexity you know, within these, these transforms um, that are showing up here. So you'll see the very first line here is we define an empty list of P collections, which we call failure collections. The next chunk there, like that's the entirety of our main pipeline processing. We read in some data, we decompress the payload if it happens to be gzip, gzip compressed, and then we write out the data. Where it gets interesting is that after that output step, we have this dot failures to failure collections. So that output step um, is actually defined. It doesn't just have an output. Well, in this case, it doesn't have an output collection because it's, it's the end. We've written out things. So it's a P done um, at the end of the day. But we've wrapped that in a, in a wrapper where we have both that P done, that's the success, and we also have a, a failure. Uh, P, you know, P collection. And we've implemented this failures to method where we can say, you know, take those failing messages, put them in this list so we don't have to worry about them right now. And in this case, we only have this one source of, of errors in the sync. If you look at our decoder.java class, you'll actually see this pattern of dot apply transform, dot failures to failures collection, dot apply transform, dot failures to failure collection. So it lets us write this linear pipeline, even though we actually do have these branches where errors are being spun off as we go. And then that last chunk of code that you see right here is we take all of those you know, different failure collections, we flatten them together, and we write them to our, our error output, which in the sync case is, is to GCS. So. Um, so we need this wrapper for having successful output and error output. 
And this is uh, kind of an idea that we were playing with in, in our code base. Um, we asked some questions on, on the dev mailing list about whether there was support for doing that sort of thing. Um, and it ended up with us actually you know, making a PR to um, include you know, our, our approach to error handling as part of um, the Beam Java SDK. So with failures um, is, is a class that's in the, the Java SDK. Um, that's what we're looking at right now in this code sample. The result class uh, nested in there is, that is this wrapper that I've been talking about where we have uh, a successful output co collection alongside a collection of, of failure elements that you know, failed the transform for whatever your definition of, of failed is. Um, this result class also implements that failures to method, uh, which I showed earlier. And that's the thing that allows you to you know, put your errors onto some lists to deal with later, and it returns the successful output so that you can apply more transforms to your successful output. Um, zooming in uh, a little bit more, uh, so this, this has given you everything that you need to you know, wrap your collections together. But this still means that you would have to implement your own do function, deal with tuple tags to define different output p collections, and you know have your logic in there that decides you know, what's a failure and what's not. So we wanted to something have something higher level than that. So uh, this with failures that result is actually hooked into map elements and flat map elements in the the Java SDK as well. So let's take a look at at that example. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know we we try to detect when a message is too large that we won't be able to write it into the BigQuery. We implement that in a AP transform that we call limit payload size. So we're, what we're looking at right now is that limit payload size class from our GCP, uh, Mozilla's GCP ingestion uh, repository. And what you'll see at the top is map elements dot into dot via. So this is you know normal invocation of map elements where we're giving it some you know, some transform to make to the data. In this case, we, we're just returning the message completely unchanged, but we're checking how large was it. And if it's too large, we throw an exception. So normally, if you threw an exception in the body of a map elements, that would bubble up, it would end up killing your worker, and the bundle would be retried. But uh, the map elements class that's, um, that's returned also has this exceptions via <clears throat> method, which you can use to basically promote uh, your map elements. So map elements would be a P transform where you're taking in a P collection and you're outputting a single P collection. When you call that exceptions via, you promote that to a transform that is taking in a P collection and is now returning a with failures dot result that wraps you know, an output P collection and, and a failure P collection. So you, you hand it um, also some, some logic uh, is an exception handler function, basically. And it gives you uh, an exception element, which contains the exception that was thrown in, in the body of your map elements along with the message. And what we're doing here is that we rethrow the exception. We catch just this payload too large that we're expecting is going to happen and that we want to send to error output. And then if there are any other exceptions that happened to be thrown in the body there, um, they, would, uh, they would still end up you know, bubbling up and you know, closing down the pipeline. So caveat here is that you know, exception handling can be messy in general. Um, it is totally possible to accidentally uh, catch more uh, exception cases than you intended to and end up basically hiding things that you're sending to error output that really should have shut down your pipeline. Um, so this is an experimental API. Um, I would love to hear feedback. If people are using this, uh, I, you know, I would love to, to hear what's working and what's not. And I think there's there's room for more, you know, for more exploration here about what are the right um, the right primitives for you know dealing with exceptions and errors and failures in general in Beam pipelines. So uh, we've talked about two topics so far, how we model data and uh, how we handle errors. Those, those are the two biggest pieces. So now we're, we're kind of 
gliding into the, the final two topics here, uh, which are about how we configure and how we test this, this code base. So I'm not going to go into all the details of configurable options we have in this code base. Um, I want to empower you to you know, browse the sync options interface that we have uh, in the repository if you really want to see you know, more examples of, of how we can modularize things. But for this talk, I'm going to focus just on how we configure different sources and syncs and hide some of that complexity via uh, Java enums. So uh, this is a basic example of invoking our pipeline, in this case, for kind of local testing. Um, but you'll see you know, a bunch of options that have been defined here um, that kind of affect pretty fundamental pieces of what's going on. So in particular, you'll see the, the second option in there is dash dash input type equals file. Um, we can, so that's talking about either write, reading a, uh, you know, a file on disk or reading a file from GCS. Basically, this is going to you know, invoke uh, file I.O. And you can you know, write instead of input type equals file, you can say input type equals pub sub or input type equals BigQuery. And as you might expect, that's kind of vastly changing what the pipeline is actually doing because we're invoking different transforms, et cetera. So this could lead to uh, a lot of spaghetti in the implementation. And we wanted a clean way of, of expressing that. So this is, again, looking at our sync.java class where previously we were talking about what's going on with the failure collections. But now I want to focus on you know, this first step where we are reading input. So you can see there, you know, options is our, you know, our instance of our sync options class. We're calling dot get input type to you know, get, in this case, file. So we're going to have some you know, file IO going on. And what input type is, is it's a, an enum value. And it has a method dot read. And that's the thing that actually returns the p transform that calls file IO dot read and does you know, related transforms that we need for our specific use cases. It's also worth noting that we are passing options in um, to that read method. So you can you know, look at additional options that are specific to the, the type of input that you're reading. So let's uh, look at what this looks like from uh, sync options. If you look at our sync options um, interface, you know it extends pipeline options. There's nothing magical about this. Um, but if you weren't aware, you can define um, enum types for uh, for your various options. Um, again, see input type uh, occurs here, and it returns an enum that is also called input type. And the last thing I want to show you here is what the implementation of input type looks like. So you can work with Java for years uh, without seeing uh, an enum that actually you know, implements methods. Um, usually enums are just for kind of giving named constants. Uh, but enums are kind of a weird in-between thing in Java where they're like very class-like, even though they aren't uh, strictly classes. Um, so if you looked further down in, in this file, you would see that we actually def define an abstract method read so that each of these values that we define has to implement a read method that ends up returning uh, a p-transform. So things are still pretty abstract uh, in this view that you're looking at um, because you know, pub sub input is a whole composite transform that calls pub sub IO and does other things. Um, but this is, this is the way we kind of hide that complexity and end up having a sync.java at the top level that's pretty easy to reason about. So final, uh, final topic is, <clears throat> how do we test uh, this pipeline? So we have several different configurations, you know, these various syncs, uh, the decoder, they have slightly different you know, inputs and outputs and requirements. And we want to make sure that we cover those in our tests. Um, there's nothing you know, particularly groundbreaking about how we approach this. This is pretty similar to how the Beam code base itself um, handles, handles testing. So we have unit tests for if there's you know, parts of a transform that can be tested alone, we try to do that. Then we have transform level tests using pAssert. Um, again, this is standard. Every transform in the, in the Beam code base uh, has, you know, uses pAssert to you know, basically run a, a local pipeline and send records through transforms. Then we have pipeline level tests that invoke uh, 
sync.main. So here we're actually passing flags like dash dash input type equals. And in this case, we read from and write to local text files. So this really does look like you know, invoking our sync class. It's you're running the transforms in the same order that they would be run in, in production. But it's using the direct runner, and it's just interacting with files locally. The next phase is integration tests, where we're doing the same thing, but now we're reading from and writing to GCP services um, rather than doing everything locally. So at this point, you need to have credentials for your, um, for your CI environment so that they can talk to those services. And then finally, you can consider this testing or not, but we do have a, a staging environment that is fed with a 1% sample of our production data so that you know, if, if, if things go badly there, we can, we can back out before we send it to production. And you will notice that that's the first place where um, data flow actually shows up. Everything else um, before that is using direct runner. And that's primarily because um, it's delightful that uh, GCP services like BigQuery, you can instantaneously define a new data set and write data there and read from it. And that all takes a couple of seconds. Whereas to actually spin up a, a data flow um, pipeline takes several minutes to get all the infrastructure all in place. So um, those, those are the topics uh, I plan to cover. So as a review, let's just kind of look at the diagram one more time and think through those those topics. So modeling modeling data, uh, we chose to use pub sub message, which is really just an opaque array of bytes and some metadata associated with it to help with routing. We handle errors um, by we've we've provided some affordances in in the way we laid our code so that we can have a linear series of, of transforms, but also uh, collect our errors and then we flatten those error collections together and write them out to um, some error output. When we talked about uh, configuration, we talked about how we used Java enums uh, with, with methods that return P transforms as a way of uh, really hiding a lot of the complexity of what's going on at the top level pipeline. And then finally, we talked through uh, a testing strategy. So some additional concerns. Um, I, I really have to touch briefly on um, Performance tuning uh, has ended up being a, a pretty big concern uh, for us, uh, for our, our scale of data. And um, also some, some details like uh, some of our syncs have you know, hundreds of tables that they're writing to. So there ends up being things you know, within the API where there are buffers um, that we might not have thought about. And you know, we've ended up with memory overflows, various things. So there have been a couple of places where we've really needed to engage GCP support. Uh, to get our pipeline back into a place where it can handle the the data volume that we're throwing at it, and I really think that this is this is okay. Um, BMIOs need to provide an extreme level of configurability, um, so they're going to need to make some assumptions, and they need to expose lots of knobs that you can turn to fit your specific use case. So, like obviously, they are not going to be as optimized in the end as it would be if you drop down to using you know, APIs for your particular data store um, in the first place. So um, that is the case for us that we uh, we ended up in a situation where some pieces of our architecture were simply too expensive um, to to run um, because we weren't able to, to optimize it to the level that we wanted to. So um, the reality is that uh, those syncs that I showed in there are, those have actually been replaced with, we've taken Kind of the, the core logic from that extracted it to a standalone um, Java application that we run in Kubernetes um, to do that job of syncing data. Um, BigQuery IO dot write has to checkpoint data multiple times as it's shuffling around. Uh, we have a whole lot more uh, control over that when we are using the um, the GCP SDKs um, directly. So this is kind of a bummer to talk about in. Um, you know, in a in a talk for for Beam Summit, um, but I think this this is a reality, and I I don't regret <laughs> the decisions that we've made. Um, I think that Beam worked great for getting us to the point where we had a fully working uh, infrastructure, and and then we were able to make that decision of like now is the time where we need to optimize cost, and we're going to take some pieces and extract them to to something else, and Beam is still 
fully serving our um, our batch you know backfill type use cases. So that code still lives in the same code base uh, alongside all of our, our all of our Beam stuff, and um, you know I, I think it's just a reality that Beam is not going to hit you know every use case um, that is out there at all scales of of data. Some other concerns we didn't talk about is like there's a lot that can be said about you know how you organize deployment and operation of your pipeline, how you monitor it. Um, there's a lot of complexity for us, particularly in how we do some out, output specific data transformations, because um, we end up taking this JSON payload and in the end for analysis we want to prevent this present this nicely structured um, table in BigQuery. And deduplication is also something that we <laughs> We think about a lot, and there there are various ways you can implement that at, at different pieces of the pipeline. So um, I I am wrapping up here. I just want to remind you, um, you know, please feel free to explore this code um, yourself. I'll make sure to throw some of these links into Slack as well, so they're more easily accessible um, after the talk. We have rendered documentation um, that's linked there as well. Um, so hopefully you can read through the, the documentation and that will also give you some more um, some more bearing to explore uh, what's going on there. Thanks so much. Um, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll take some questions right now and I'll hang out on Slack as well afterwards if you want to ask questions there. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. That was very interesting. Um, we have a Question from the audience that already came in. Um, question goes, nice wrapper. What version was that added in? Yeah, so I believe this is talking about the, yeah, with failures.result um, wrapper. And I cannot remember, um, but I, I would guess, so we're, we're, we're currently at 2.23. It, it's probably, it, it was probably about a year ago um, that it was added. So uh, I would guess, it might have been 2.19, something around there. Okay, we'll do some Googling after the session, I guess. <laughs> sure, yeah, 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 I'll follow up in Slack and give you an exact answer there. Uh, even better, awesome. Um, a second question came in, um, is the pipeline primarily batch or streaming? Yeah, so it is, it is primarily um, streaming. So at least from, you know, what do these words even mean? Uh, but from a, a Beam data flow perspective, um, you know, the, that whole diagram of where things are flowing, it's running in streaming mode um, and, you know, and interacting with, with PubSub uh, mostly. And then it's only for the, the backfill scenarios where we, are, um, where, we are, where we are running Beam in batch mode. Um, but uh, the BigQuery syncs um, themselves, there's complexity there of, you know, BigQuery actually has you know, a streaming API where you can stream, you know, stream data in and have it be available within seconds. Um, or, you know, BigQuery IO can do um, batch loads where it's batching up records underneath. So we, we have mostly been using uh, batching at the, the BigQuery piece. So in reality, it's, you know, data producers are sending us messages and they end up in BigQuery, you know, about 10 to 20 minutes later. Um, based on the batching that's happening in, in BigQuery IO. And that's also where we had our biggest um, performance issue because doing all of that batching um, and, and checkpointing is where we were you know, consuming lots of money on solid state disks uh, in order to handle the, the volume of data we needed. Okay, cool. That's um, maybe something that hopefully will get optimized at some point. Um... Maybe a question that I'm I'm curious about as well is um, the, there's a new data flow runner uh, or a new version of the runner that came out very very recently. Any plans on looking at it or um, already looking at that by any chance? Um, yeah, so we yeah we have on our backlog various various things that we'd like to look at um, for the future. So we we haven't done um, any real investigation um, so far. But um, yeah, I mean, Dataflow has has flex templates um, available in beta, which we're really interested in taking advantage of and could clean up some of the configuration we need to do. Um, yep, and it's a matter of yep finding the the time budget to to look more into where we're going in the future. That makes perfect sense. Yep. Cool. Um, I think that wraps up the last 
talk of the day then. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow with more sessions and more workshops. I myself am going to get some sleep over here in, um, in London. But um, I want to um, remember that everybody can join the networking session tomorrow at um, 6 o'clock UTC time. Uh, and you can find some more information on the blog section of the website. Oh, and I see there might be... There's another question that came in. Is that fine if you take another one, Jeff? Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> Just last minute. <laughs> um, thanks for the talk. Uh, the error handling approach looks nice. Any other ideas on error handling that can be improved in the Beam APIs? Also, any plans to contribute the error flatten, flatten pattern? Uh, and or other beam pipelines patterns talk. That's uh, that is actually a really good um, suggestion. We we have not considered that previously. Um, yeah, I, I think if if that does seem like something that is non obvious enough, um, and and actually I, I'm was kind of hoping that this talk would be a little bit of like things that don't really fit in patterns, but like you want to see an example of of how these things all fit together. So yeah, if there are pieces of this that that could be um, patterns, I think we'd love to contribute those. So again, we can talk. I'll I'll be looking at Slack after this, and we can continue discussion there too. Awesome, new contributors to the project. <laughs> That's great. <cool. laughs>